easy to forget. Hi everybody, we're gonna give everyone like a minute to slowly trickle in and then we will get started shortly. Super excited to have you guys all here. Um, so yeah, just hold on tight. All right, so as people start trickling in, I just wanna welcome you guys to, um, now it's been like our, I don't even know what number um, talk for the uh, Wilderness and Emergency Medicine Lecture Series that we have going. I have two of my new board members here as we take this international. I have Katrina and Alex. That's gonna help me run this talk. Before we get started, Katrina is gonna go over some ground rules and introduce herself. So Katrina. Hi, my name is Katrina Stevens. Um, today, we're gonna ask everyone to keep your mic on mute, um, but feel free to leave your videos on and you can add your institution to your uh, name or you can add it in the chat box so we can see where everyone's coming from today. Um, and then feel free to toss your questions in the chat box throughout the um, talk and we'll do a Q&A session at the end. Awesome. So yeah, just to reiterate exactly what Katrina said, if you have any questions also during the talk, feel free to send us a message um, through the chat box or email us and we will get back to you. And with that, we are going to go ahead and get started because I know you guys are all here and we're excited to hear a speaker talk today. So thanks for coming, you guys. Yeah, welcome, everybody. My name is Alex. I'm a second year medical student at Vanderbilt. Um, for those here for the first time, this project was started single handedly last year by Shilpi and it's gotten really popular. Uh, with all of you guys and your interests. Um, so to help her out, we're transitioning to a board um, that is helping keep this keep this happen. Uh, it's an international group, and we're really excited to keep learning with you guys about wilderness medicine uh, with our fantastic speakers like Dr. Van Tilburg. Um, so you can see all of these wonderful faces of people we've got brought on this year that you'll see kind of leading the talks as we keep going through the year. A little bit about our mission. Uh, so the mission of this project is to create an international free platform to learn about all these cool ways to incorporate emergency and wilderness medicine into our future careers. I started coming to these talks in the fall and I've just been hooked since. Uh, I think they're so fun and cool to learn about. Um, we also want this to be an international community as wilderness medicine often crosses borders. And with that, we really value diversity and being culturally competent. Uh, if you ever think there's any ways we can improve on that, let us know. So here's our lineup of talks uh, in the past and what we have coming up for the next couple of months. I'm super excited about the lineup we've got and throughout the year, our website will keep being updated. Um, you should be able to have the link with that in our emails. So with that, I will uh, introduce our speaker. So we have Dr. Van Tilburg um, talking to us about rescue medicine today. He is a wilderness emergency and occupational medicine physician. He's a staff physician at Providence Hood River Memorial Hospital, where he works in occupational travel medicine, the emergency department, Mountain Clinic at Mount Hood Meadows Ski Resort. And we just learned that he is also overseeing all of the public health uh, stuff with COVID in Hood River. So busy, busy man, glad to have him here. Um, he serves as an active member and medical director of the Crag Rats Mountain, Me Mountain Rescue, medical director of Portland's Mountain Rescue, chair of Mountain Rescue Association, uh, delegate for the International Committee of Alpine Rescue. There it is, Hood River County Public Health Officer and Medical Examiner for four Oregon counties. He's the author of a number of books, including The Mountain Rescue Doctor, uh, which was shortlisted for the Banff Festival of Mountain Books and the Oregon Book Awards. Short Rescue Stories, uh, including a wilderness doctor's life and tales, death tales of risk and reward. So he is also the first author of Wilderness Medical Society Practice Guidelines for Prevention and Management of Avalanche and Non-Avalanche Snow Burial Accidents. So you can see his long list of things he does. Um, really glad to have you here, Dr. Van Tilburg. Uh, so thank you. And finally, uh, we already talked about mission. So thanks for being here, guys. I'm excited to have it. And at the end, we will take your questions. Um, if you have questions during the talk, just go ahead and put them in the chat for us. Uh, we'll keep an eye on that uh, and at towards the end of the talk we will have time for all your questions so again thanks for being here um thank you very much for the introduction thanks for um having me um 
I, I am kind of busy with COVID, but I'm not too busy that I'm not going skiing tomorrow or I am going skiing tomorrow. So um, we're supposed to get uh, six or eight inches of snow tonight. So um, what I, um, and so, so my primary job is occupational and travel medicine and then part-time in the emergency room. Uh, but I have a lot of other hobby jobs as um, Alex uh, mentioned. And so um, what I decided to do today, I, I'm going to try to go a little bit fast so we have more time for questions. And what I decided to do is give a talk about the lessons I lear I've learned in doing 22 years of mountain rescue. So I'm a, a active member of Hood River Crag Rats Mountain Rescue Team and their medical director. And I'm, as Alex mentioned, Portland Mountain Rescue. I also supervise two uh, ground search and rescue teams in neighboring counties. And so um, I've been doing this for 22 years. I go, I, I myself personally go on about 20, 20 to 25 rescues a year. So it's, you know, pretty busy. It's, you know, three or four a month, one a week uh, sometimes. And so um, I put together a collection of um, lessons. I call it, fifth. there's 15 lessons here. They really apply to all kinds of wilderness medicine applications. And they actually apply to, I gave this for a similar talk for Grand Rounds at the hospital in Portland, uh, because it really applies to a lot of things we do in medicine. And so hopefully you can, um, you can um, apply this to wherever you are and whatever you're doing. I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, can you guys see that okay? Yep, looks good. Um, okay. <laughs> So this is a picture of Mount Hood. This is, and I, as I mentioned, I'm gonna kind of go a little bit fast because I wanna have lots of time for questions. Um, this is my team. This is uh, Hood River Crag Rats, and we are the oldest mountain rescue team in the United States, formed in 1926. And I was, I was just on a patrol up at Mount Rainier in Washington, and part of our patrol is to be on call for rescues, and we got called for rescue up on the Mirror Snowfield at uh, midnight at um, uh, about 8,000 feet. And uh, we got done and we wrapped up the rescue and we got home and I looked at our history and the, the last time we had been uh, respond, uh, responding to mountain, uh, mountain rescue at Mount Rainier was, was 1929. So there was a big gap in our response to Mount Rainier. This is a picture of Mount Hood. This is uh, in the uh, 30s when the Craig Rat Mountain Rescue Team did guided tours. Those sticks there are uh, alpine stocks. Uh, which are what we had before we had ice axes to help you climb up the mountain and, and get down. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is risk, and that's really a big part of mountain rescue and wilderness medicine. And I'm going to talk about risk in two sorts of contexts, and it's really uh, the probability of mishap, which, you know, that's what, um, you know, our moms and dads think about when we're doing dangerous things, they, they uh, worry about the chance of us um, getting hurt. But really in a lot of what we do in wilderness medicine is the consequence of a, of a mishap. So we're far away from help when there's a mishap and um, we have uh, a big uh, uh, austere conditions to deal with. So a sprained ankle, if you're a mile from your car is not a big deal. A sprained ankle, uh, two days walk from your car in a snowstorm is a big deal. And so this is the risk matrix, which if you're not familiar with, you will be eventually in your career if you do wilderness medicine. So as probability goes up, um, your um, uh, chance of uh, risk of bad accident goes up, but uh, as consequence goes up, you have uh, the potential for a bad outcome also. And so it's when these two merge that you get problems when the uh, probability of an accident is high and you have, there's an accident and then the consequence is great. So this is a lady we evacuated from Eagle Trail who had, uh, it was the first presentation of a benign insulinoma. So her blood sugar was undetectable and her uh, temperature was 33, I think. Uh, this is on Mount Hood, this is on, sorry, on uh, Mount Everest. This is um, the year of the ice fall that killed the a dozen Sherpas. Um, I was on an expedition up there, uh, not to climb, but just to get to base camp and back. Um, and so in that context of risk, um, and that's where these lessons come from, because in mountain rescue, it's all, it's all a balance. And it's like that in a lot of medicine, you, we take risks and sometimes we get rewards and sometimes we don't. And so I'm going to talk about 
what we do, what I do, and my teams do uh, before missions, during missions, and after missions. And so, you know, think of this in the context of your own life, you know, about approaching problems more than anything. So before we go on missions, training is important, right? And that's kind of what you're doing today. You're, you're training, you're learning. And the question that always comes up is how much training is enough? And we don't really know how much training is enough. For example, in this case, this is a dislocated shoulder on Mount Hood, and I was able to reduce it right there on the scene. I used the snowbird method, uh, sitting on a rock. I, we had a, a mountain rescuer with a dislocated two nights or two weeks ago in a night rescue. And same thing, sitting on a rock and using the rock for counter traction. But the question that comes up in wilderness medicine, especially when supervising people, you know, if you've, if you've learned how to do this once or you took a wilderness first responder course and they kind of taught you how to do it, but you've never actually done it, is it safe to do? Is it safe to have a mountain guide who is non, not a medical person try to do a shoulder reduction if they're in the middle of nowhere? And um, I'm not sure I have that question to answer, but I can tell you training is really important. Okay, so this is the result of being able to reduce a dislocated shoulder. Are, is there any consequences for, you know, trying to reduce a dislocated shoulder if you're not trained? Of course, you know, you can it might not be a shoulder dislocation. It might be a unstable fracture or a stable fracture and you just made an unstable fracture, for example, or you might have a nerve impingement and you've made things worse. So, so there are problems. So training is really important. Um, this was the same spot two years before a lady with an open uh, patellar tendon fracture that we had to carry her out. And this is the great benefit of training and learning this stuff because if you can reduce a shoulder and you don't have to carry somebody out over dangerous train. It's a, it's a huge benefit. Um, don't forget the basics. You know, we tend to, um, as you know, mountain rescuers uh, tend to be tech heavy. I mean, we love high tech gadgets and we love um, um, complicated rope rescue systems, but it's really important to get the basics down. It's really important, especially when we do multi-agency rescues. So we have a team, you know, to, Two weeks ago, we did a night rescue with a helicopter hoist. So we had a mountain rescue team there. We had a ground SAR team there. We had a volunteer fire department there. We had a Coast Guard helicopter and we had a state trooper that walked up to the scene. And so it was, um, you know, a lot of different people. And if you know the basics really well, uh, that's, that's vitally important. So here's a rope rescue we did for a um, closed head injury. Um, I intubated this person, uh, had a good outcome, and this was the extrication. And this was, if, you, if you're a rock climber or you're a mountaineer, you know that this is the most basic rope rescue system you can build, although the anchors were very difficult because they're at the, at the end of these uh, ropes up here on um, big Douglas fir tree. But this is a one-to-one -one mechanical advantage, so no mechanical advantage. And it's not ideal, but it's what we had to work with. So very simple. And this, this crew right here is from uh, four different agencies. Um, <clears throat> this is what we like to use. I'm not a big fan of this. This is the multi, the MPD uh, made by CMC Rescue. It's a, a rope lowering and raising system that's very complicated, but I'm a really big proponent of being simple. I mean, if I climb the south side of Mount Hood, I have uh, this in my pack, you know, a couple pulleys, handful of carabiners and two prussics. Actually, I don't even take full pulleys. I just take the little wheel and put it on a carabiner and that works as a pulley. So keeping things simple. Um, choosing gear mindfully, you know, we're all in medicine. And if you're interested in wilderness medicine, like I said, we love high-tech equipment, but there is a compromise with high-tech equipment. And so that's important to know if you're buying the greatest, best carbon fiber, titanium, aluminum, spectra, crampons, they, they, they cost more, they might not be as durable, and they might compromise some function. So it's just really important to think about equipment um, critically. This is a great paper. I love this paper. Uh, because for a long time we taught femoral traction splints in mountain mountain medicine, and as it turns out, this paper, as this paper demonstrated, um, mountain rescuers don't remember how to use them. Mountain rescuers, it's another device to put in your pack and have to get up the trail, um, and uh, and patients are stable or dead, and so you're you're not going to save, you're not going to stop somebody from exsanguinating from a femoral fracture, but you certainly will alleviate their pain. And you can do that with uh, putting them in a, linter, a litter and making a splint. So the point is that 
think critically about equipment. And here's a femur traction splint made out of a ski pole, um, which many of you have maybe done. This is this is a picture on Mount Hood when we had this mountain uh, locator unit, which is basically an animal tracker that was exclusive to Mount Hood. And we used it to rescue climbers who were in trouble or find climbers and were in trouble. This picture is from about uh, 20 years ago. And um, the reason I showed this picture is because we finally retired this device just a year ago. And we retired it because of the ubiquitous cell phones and GPS units. And so we finally got rid of this. So it's, sometimes it's okay to let go of technology. Sometimes technology just revolutionizes the world. And we've seen that, you know, with Tesla, you know, whoever's got Tesla stock, you know, that they're revolutionizing the world. So this picture on the left is Craig Rats on Mount Hood with an Alpenstock, which is a safety, you know, stick that people climb mountains with. And then these two guys, this is from uh, the late 50s, early 60s. This is a, the guy in the front has an Alpenstock and the guy in the back has a brand new revolutionary tool and it's the ice axe, right? It just revolutionized climbing safety. And so um, this is my kit that I take if I'm going up the south side of Mount Hood. It's very lightweight. It's not ideal. Um, this is a basically the helmet's a piece of styrofoam, but it is rated for an axial load on the head from a rock. Uh, aluminum ice axe, aluminum crampons, and a very small harness. So definitely there's some compromise here. And the point is just to recognize the compromise. Uh, this is a paper I wrote about drones. So we're using drones now more and more. If you are interested in a project and you get involved with drones, it's um, really gonna, it's it's really a cutting edge right now in, in uh, search and rescue and, and wilderness medicine. Uh, this is what we use to communicate. So we use our phones now to send out texts, you know, and you probably may have um, an Everbridge um, account with your county to get emergency notifications. And if you don't use Gaia or CalTOPO, learn how to use it. It's just a phenomenal. It basically is a GPS app for your phone. And it works so much better than a separate GPS unit because it's on your phone and you always have your phone with you. And you can practice using this and get really good with it. Uh, if you're going out for a noon run, run, or you're going out for a bike ride with your friends, or you're going out with a hike with your family. And so it's just an awesome, uh, device to or app for your phone. We use my team uses Gaia. Uh, we looked at using CalTOPO. They have a sub version of CalTOPO called SARTOPO, which allows you to interface with um, anybody on your team and share maps uh, while you're in a rescue. And you can see on your phone where the other teams are on SARTOPO. It's just a really phenomenal um, way to use technology. Um, batteries is a big issue, right? And you all know that like everything takes a different gauge. It's just really difficult. I mean, I just got a new avalanche beacon this year and it's a different gauge battery than my previous avalanche beacon. And they're both made by the same manufacturer. So, you know, just batteries are an issue, power's an issue. So um, practice is different than training. And that's an important piece. And Malcolm Gladwell in his book, he says, well, you need 10,000 hours to be an expert. Well. Really, if you look at the literature, what's most important is that you practice mindfully and you, you know, you you think about what you're doing and you go through it and you have you practice. And so practice is different than training. So you have to practice this stuff over and over and over. This is a snow cave I built after my first wilderness medicine conference in 1994. I was an intern um, at Salt Lake City and I learned how to build a snow cave. I built this snow cave. It's a hybrid igloo snow cave because it's um uh, because of the low snowpack and I went to bed in my, um, I went to sleep in my bed this night because this is what happened the next morning, right? So I built it incorrectly. So I trained, I learned how to build it, but you got to build, you got to practice this stuff over and over. This is practicing with the gamma bag at um, Kumjang in Nepal on the way to Everest Base Camp. So I took this picture at 14,000 feet, but you can see we practicing with the hypobaric chamber uh, pressurizing it to 10,000 feet um, for simulation if we had a uh, altitude illness. Uh, this is my daughter. One, one, one year I got a canoe and my daughters were eight and 10 and I wanted them to practice uh, life-saving skills. So I told them we're going up to the pool and um, the locker room's closed so, closed. so wear your swimsuit under your clothes. And oh, by the way, wear some old tennis shoes. And as we walked to the pool fully dressed, I pushed them both in. I didn't tell them I was doing it. And so we spent an hour, you know, and they, they were on the verge of tears and then there was laughter and stuff. And so it was okay. But the point is 
you don't have to be in the wilderness to practice this stuff. You know, I tell people, if you want to practice with your avalanche beacon, practice in your backyard. If you want to practice life-saving, you know, uh, with your kayak, practice in the public pool. Our public pool has a, like one night a week where you can bring your kayak into the public pool. So practice this stuff. Okay. If you're healthy, don't go. This is really, really difficult, you know, because as mountain rescuers and uh, you all are, you know, in medicine and you're, you, you, you're can do people and you want to go and you want to learn this stuff. And it's hard not to go if you're not healthy. So that's just really important. Okay. So a couple things about being in the heat of the moment while you're on, while we're on a rescue or while you're on a wilderness crisis, or if you're on a crisis in the uh, hospital or whatever, um, I, I just picked three things because I can't, I can't discuss every piece of risk and every lesson I've learned while we're in the thick of it. But these are some lessons of while we're in the middle of a wilderness emergency. So the first thing is you have to protect yourself and then your team and then your subject. And we do this regular, we, regularly. We change our plans. We don't rescue people sometimes in the middle of the night. We've turned around. We've um, delayed rescues. And so it's important. Rescue safety is really, really important. The last thing you want to do is go on an avalanche rescue and a sympathetic avalanche or some hang fire falls and injures a rescuer. So really important. This is a rescue in a canyon. A woman who had a, <coughs> excuse me, a, I think she had an ankle fracture and an open patellar fr uh, fracture and maybe a pelvis fracture that was stable and an elbow fracture. And so I rappelled down to her, and this is the medic from the um, army guard. Uh, yeah, the army guard. And um, so this is a floating log jam or we're actually, you know, standing on floating logs. And so um, we, we got her and then we decided to get her dog. This is why she fell in the first place because her dog's right here. If you can see my cursor. And this is as close as the volunteer firefighters could get. They couldn't get to her any closer. And so we decided to get the dog and we put the backpack we, we sent down an empty backpack. Um, I lifted the dog into the backpack while my buddy Jim was wearing it. And as he was going, getting raised up this cliff, he smacked his knee and split it open and had to go to the hospital for stitches. So injury to the rescuers happens. So be careful. This is the Craig Rats on a big uh, mission on the north side of Mount Hood that made international news. It was in 2006 for three climbers. And when I took this picture down to the Hood River News, I asked them to crop out the Shiva's Regals bottle there. But, um, but this is planning the rescue and uh, Jim Wells is operations chief. These are two colleagues from Portland Mountain Rescue and this is a uh, Hood River Craig Rat rescuer. And this is the board. Uh, Jim was uh, operations chief. This is our advanced base camp, our advanced search and rescue base on Mount Hood. It's a cabin at 6,000 feet that's only accessible in the winter by skis or snowcat. <clears throat> But you can't see the objective on this board, but the first objective is not to rescue the missing climbers. It's protect yourself from uh, hypothermia, avalanche, and frostbite, uh, really dangerous conditions. And so, um, <clears throat> and so protecting the rescuers, right? The second thing is we were running into this, I think, in the 22 years I've been doing this more and more, is balancing situational awareness and distractions. And I think it might be part of because our culture is so used to being distracted. You know, we get phone texts all the time, and you've probably done that. You know, you're you're in a in a cubby documenting on one patient chart, and the nurse comes in and says, "Oh, can I give room for another dose of Dilaudid?" And you're also on hold, waiting to talk to the attending on a third patient. And you know, you, we're doing stuff all the time, and it's just it's you got to be really really careful about making mistakes in all components of medicine. And so multitasking doesn't work, except for a very few people in a very few situations. It just doesn't work. And it has to do with, I don't know exactly how it works, but it has to do with your brain pausing one task, going to another task. And then when you return to the first task, you lose your bookmark and a microsecond can make a difference in a situation. And so, uh, here's, a, here's an example, you know, this is in a, on a rescue, on a trail, uh, Mark's building a, a rope rescuing system. And if he pauses for a second to answer a radio call from SAR base or pauses for a second for a question, you know, he's distracted from doing sort of a critical task. So just be careful. 
Here is a, I hope this video plays. This is a video. Oh, good, it's going to. This is a video. Let me tell you uh, what the video is first. This is, a, well, let me just play it here. This is a rarity, this video. Okay, I might have just screwed it up here. Let me see. There we go. This is a rarity. This is CPR in the field. And I, this is news footage, so it's public. I was watching this rescue from my office because I couldn't go on it. And um, there's a couple interesting things about this rescue. One is um, they're in a very dangerous spot on Mount Hood. You'll see when it zooms in here, there's two bystanders um, pushing rocks and ice fall out of the way. And then there are two people doing CPR and they are, um, uh, they're all bystanders. They're all like, uh, well, actually, I think two of them are volunteers and maybe two or two of them were just good Samaritans and two might've been um, through, from Portland Mountain Rescue. But you can see there the ice fall very dangerous spot. And the reason why I wanted to sh show this is partly for situational awareness and partly to be careful of adrenaline when it's flowing in our systems is that they did CPR for two hours on this person. And if any of you have done trauma rotations or you're a trauma surgeon or experience in that, you know that blunt trauma, unwitnessed blunt trauma in the backcountry the chance of survival is extremely low. And this guy fell 6,000 uh, feet uh, off the summit, off near the summit of Mount Hood. And so the reason this is important for situational awareness is they did a, what, I, what I felt was a fairly risky helicopter extrication for somebody who had CPR for two hours. And so you really have to think twice. We have a problem on Mount Hood with helicopters in that A, we don't have very many. B, we have... 15,000 people try to climb Mount Hood every year and see uh, we had a lawsuit involving a delay in a helicopter rescue that settled out of court. And so our search managers are very quick to call rescues. And it's very difficult as being, we had a helicopter rescue two weeks ago in a canyon and it was a Coast Guard helicopter. And I was a uh, uh, site commander and it was, it's very difficult to say don't, we don't want a helicopter in here. You've got to call off the helicopter when the adrenaline's flowing and you know you want to save a life. And that particular one we had two weeks ago, the um, patient's uh, temperature was 33 when he got to the hospital. So probably when I was taking care of him, it was 32 or 31. Okay, so how do we mitigate some of these stuff? How do we mitigate this checklist? You all probably know this, this is old. I mean, if you're doing clerkships and uh, if you're in residency or you're a practicing physician watching this, you know that um, we use, you know, checklists all the time. This is Atul Gwande's book, which is about adapting the FAA, Federal Aviation Administration in the United States, checklist system to adapting it to surgery. And particularly, he's promoted it in uh, his own hospital and elsewhere. But Checklist, the reason checklists work is they work at times when we're calm and we can think through things. And then when the adrenaline hits, um, you know, it's uh, you don't have to sort of think as much. And I got to tell you, the adrenaline um, reaction is fairly powerful, as you may know. Uh, you know, just a few years ago, uh, I've been doing this for 22 years. And a few years ago, I was on my back deck after a bike ride, still in my bike clothing, drinking some lemonade with my daughters. And I got a text from the sheriff office that said, um, fallen hiker, Eagle Creek, CPR in progress. And that's a 20 minute drive from my house. And it's really hard, really, you can't, you can't control it, right? You just drop everything, throw on your rescue crows, meet your buddies up at the truck, drive hundred miles an hour with lights and sirens and get to the scene. And so it happens to everybody. So, so be careful, be cognizant of that. So checklists work. We use a technical rigors guide. This is um, developed um, uh, by a climbing company and it works really well. It's a, a cheat sheet for rope rescue systems. We have this avalanche field rescue guide, which is sort of a quick reminder of the procedure. Here is a, this is the card that our ski patrollers up at Mount Hood Meadows uh, ski resort work. So this card is, um, uh, uh, their avalanche rescue card. And so, um, you know, the first, I already mentioned this, but the first thing on here is, is the scene safe? So it kind of walks you through what you should do. On the back side is the witness statement. Very critical part in mountain medicine uh, to 
get an accurate history. It's so critical. It's, it's, I mean, we shortcut histories in the hospital all the, uh, I shouldn't say we, I say, I shortcut histories all the time, right? We shortcut history. Somebody's got belly's pain, you press on their belly, they got rebound tenderness, they got a white count of 15 that the nurse ordered before you even saw the patient. You know, you're going to call the surgeon, right? So we tend to shortcut, but in here, this situation, it's so critical to get an accurate history. Multiple times we have been, once I got called for a heart attack up on Mount Hood and we called the we called the guy and he said, you know, oh, um, you know, we're driving 90 miles an hour with lights blaring and people are pulling out of the way. And we called the guy, I wasn't driving. So I called the guy and he said, oh, my wife called in a 911 call. I'm not, I'm not, I don't think I'm having a heart attack. So I'm like, are you having chest pain? Cause I'm thinking, you've got SVT or you've got, you know, some other abnormality. And he says, no, I'm not having any chest pain. And I says, well, what's the problem? He said, well, we, and he said, well, I have a heart murmur. And I said, so, and then I'm thinking, you know, he had a recent valve replacement or what, you know, it could be a number of things. And, he, and I said, well, what, what's, what's going on with your murmur? And he says, oh, well, I had a murmur when I was a kid, but it went away. And I said, so what, 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 what do you, what do you, how do you need us to help you? And he said, I'm stuck in the middle of a stream and I can't get out, but I'm completely fine. So accurate history is important. So we slow down, we turn the lights off. And, and so it's just, it's really, really important. Okay. This is our, this is, we use this in Oregon, in the United States, our urgency worksheet. It's a checklist to help us gauge what resources we need and, um, and what uh, kind of response we need. Do we need to get you know, six rescuers out of bed at two in the morning, or can we get 15 rescuers out of bed at six in the morning, that kind of thing. Um, safety pauses work. I'm a really big fan of safety pauses. You all use them as Epic. If you use Epic, you're familiar with the say the timeout. Um, some people call it timeout. Some people call it a safety pause. Um, so this is you know before you do a procedure. In my hospital, you have to go through this safety check to make sure you have the right patient and the right site and the right procedure and you've marked it and uh, you've got a consent sign and all that stuff. And so it's really, really important. This is kind of a version of the safety pause I use in my clinic. I work uh, three days a week in a travel medicine, occupational medicine uh, clinic. And uh, we have a board, we have a huddle board and we go through uh, the week's issues. It goes on this board. If it takes more than um, two minutes to discuss, it doesn't go on this board. I mean, that's a different venue. If it takes more than, if it's, if this board has more than six or eight things on it, we, um, we break them up into two meetings. It's like a five minute huddle at the beginning of the week to just check in with everybody and discuss important issues. Really, really important. Um, in Mountain Rescue now, uh, in Oregon, uh, a lot of the, all the teams that I, um, medical direct, we use the SARGAR. And so this is um, developed by the US Coast Guard. Uh, GAR is for green, amber, red. We use a modified version of this. I was gonna show you that, but I decided to show you the original GAR because I think it's most valuable to you. And then you can modify this however you want. But the SARGAR is a safety pause right before you leave the truck and head up the trail or up the mountain. And it's after the planning's done, after you've got your assignment, after you've got your team and you rate uh, these six categories, zero through 10, 10 being dangerous, zero being, I have no concerns whatsoever. And so, you know, you're rating your supervisor, which is really important and you're rating your team. Um, and that's really important. Now, um, Portland Mountain Rescue, uh, has changed, uh, team selection and team fitness to, to just, just team. And then they added in equipment. Do they have, do we have the proper equipment for this mission. So you rate those all in your head. If you've got five people on a hasty team, everybody rates this on their own and you in your brain uh, plot it, where do where does this mission lie? And this all all this this process takes about three minutes or less. And then the leader goes around the circle and asks everybody one question. Are you green, amber or red? Are you green, amber or red? And oftentimes you go around the circle and everybody's green. Oftentimes you go around the circle and everybody's yellow or one, if one person's yellow, they say why they're yellow. I'm yellow because um, I just did a rescue uh, last night and I was up all night and I'm a little tired or I'm yellow because I'm worried about the uh, cloud pattern. We could have a storm rolling in. So whatever, you get the idea. And if one person's red, you got to put a stop and reassess. So it's a great model for a safety pause. Um, let's see, I think I'm doing okay on time. Um, 
this is something I could talk for a whole hour upon. Uh, and this is something we see um, uh, perfectly demonstrated in COVID. And you all are going to recognize this, but this is a very, and this is, um, we, we, in avalanche safety, they talk about heuristic traps all the time. And so what a, what this is, is a heuristic trap is a human error caused by a shortcut. So some people call these rules of thumb. Some people call them um, shortcuts. Some people, um, you know, there's different terms, of, but what they are is they, it's a way that we as humans shortcut decision-making and they're very dangerous. Okay. So these are the most popular, you know, if you look this up, the psychologist will give you 20 different types of heuristic traps. These are the ones we talk about in avalanche safety. These are the ones that are probably important for wilderness medicine. So um, let me see if, I, oh, I think I had some explanations here, but I wanted to keep it short. So I'm going to give you an example. I'm going skiing tomorrow in the back country. So I'm going to give you an example of how this works. Familiarity. We're going to the same place we go all the time when the avalanche danger is high. We're, we go here all the time. Consistency. I've never seen this path slide. Acceptance. Well, if Van Tilburg's going, must be safe, right? So expert halo. That's when we think that we are an expert. And so we jump to the conclusion that we don't do a full assessment, for example. Scarcity, we never get powder snow like this in Oregon. We have to go. And so that happens a lot on Mount Hood. People fly in from Texas or New York or um, wherever, and they're climbing Mount Hood because they don't get a chance to do it very often. Uh, and then social facility. And this happens on Mount Hood too. This happened to me on Mount Hood when I um, uh, when I've been up there before, like, oh, I see another party in the pearly gates almost at the summit. It's probably fine if another party's up there. So anyway, you get the idea. You have to be careful of these in wilderness medicine. You constantly have to reassess and, um, and be careful. So, and especially when you're doing multi-agency missions, this is a body recovery on the Luthold Square on Mount Hood, um, multi-agency. This is a story, if you want to read more about um, social dynamics and human dynamics, this is a really good story in the New York Times. It's a little bit old now, it's four or five years old, but this is the uh, avalanche in Tunnel Creek. Nine people caught in an avalanche and uh, three died. Um, the incident command system works. This is another way we mitigate risks when they're middle of the, um, when we're in the middle of uh, a rescue. Um, and so this is the Canadian website. There's a, there, we use this all over the world. And so what the incident command system is, is it's a structure of addressing a crisis. You can do an incident command structure with three people. You can do the incident command structure with 400 people. And so it's just a way of working together and, um, and having some supervision, having dispute resolution. And if you're involved at all in COVID response, you're probably in an incident command uh, type system. Okay, so um, I'm gonna, that's good. I might've got about a few more slides and I'll have, we'll have some time for questions if people have questions. Um, so I talked about before you go, kind of the lessons I think are important. I talked about just a few lessons while you're in the middle of a rescue. And then I wanna just mention a few things after we go on missions. And these are just as important as the other things. And so one is going home, turning around, stopping the mission. And we have done this multiple times. It's really hard to do, but if things aren't safe, you have to get help. We do this in medicine because we have a culture of that in medicine where we, um, if we don't know, we're, if we, we're perplexed or we're not sure, we call specialists, right? I'm, I've been working in the emergency department for 22 years and Sometimes I think in a shift, that's all I do is call specialists for help, it seems like. And if you're a specialist, you probably think the same thing. That's all the ER docs do is call me for help. So, uh, but we're not used to doing that necessarily in wilderness medicine. So it's really important to know your own um, boundaries. Here's a river rescue for a body recovery where we don't have swift water rescue. So we opted to call in a dive rescue team to do this uh, body recovery. This is a, a famous rescue on Mount Hood uh, from 2006. Three climbers uh, died. Uh, one body we found, um, two bodies we never found. Um, but this is a very famous, it was made national news, international news. Um, this was a 14 day search, um, but the, the, the thing about this rescue is these, this um, 
these people left their car on a Thursday, got into trouble on a Saturday, and one person in the party called nine or called his wife, who then called nine one one on a Saturday, left on Thursday, got into trouble on Saturday. This is the first team to respond to this um, this mission, and this was Monday at 10, 10 a.m. So, um, so we don't always uh, respond right away to um, missions. So people really have to try to be self-reliant as possible. And this is the same. This is the same day we had a summit team up here in a Chinook uh, looking for a body up here. My team was going up to the top of this uh, snowfield called Snow Dome and uh, trying to get over to the uh, Elliott Glacier headwall to see if somebody, the guys had fallen down the Elliott Glacier headwall. Um, so address residual effects on rescuers. We're doing this a lot now and police and fire departments have done this for a while. Uh, some, uh, and now in mountain medicine and search and rescue and wilderness medicine, we're, just, we're really embracing this. There's a, uh, a couple of people around the United States and the world who are uh, really leading this. And some people call it psychological first aid. I don't love that term, but that's what you're using. Um, uh, it begins with fatigue and exhaustion, and then it um, it turns into acute stress disorder. That's the term that I use. I've taken care of a couple of these people. One was a ski patroller, got caught in an avalanche in, uh, in my mountain and came to my clinic. Um, but uh, there's, a, there's words for this. This is a billable, an ICD-9 code, and it's billable. So I use acute stress disorder. You can use brief reactive depression is another term. Um, uh, some people use um, stress reaction, which is not a billable term, but um, but it's it's not it doesn't have the stigma of PTSD, and it probably isn't PTSD. Um, and so it's important to recognize this in rescuers. And here's kind of what it looks like if you're a layperson, or you're a medical director, and you're supervising an EMS team or a search and rescue team. Um, you know, this is this is kind of one of the common um, cards people use. Green is you're ready to go, you're stress free. Reacting, you know, you had a bad experience and you're kind of feeling down because you went on a plane crash and you brought uh, three bodies out and five bodies. Flying on, on getting. Um, some medical treatment. So anyway, this is important. And so uh, think about it. And so uh, debrief is important. Uh, we have a number of ways we debrief. We debrief with um, uh, at, at the end of the mission like this, we all stand around and do it. We do it very quickly. You know, has anybody lost anything? Does anybody damage equipment? Anybody hurt? Uh, you do this kind of, well, Sometimes you do this after a, a code in the hospital, not always, but ideally, you know, we should, but um, we do formal debriefs. This is a plane crash. We did a formal debrief, which has been kind of shown not to be all that effective. We had a psychologist come up from Portland and we sat down and tried to do a formal debrief. We use this once in my emergency room. It works really great. It's a framework for doing a debrief when you have a problem you need to fix. So you, you plot out, you list, you can list them or plot them. Uh, strengths and weaknesses. So those are internal. So what are you doing right? And what's the problem you need to fix? And then external, what are your opportunities and what are your threats? So how, how are you going? How can the problem get worse with your threats? And what are your opportunities to fix it? So it's just a framework to use for debrief. Um, lastly, uh, preventative SAR work. So preventative search and rescue. And there's uh, been more and more of this happening, particularly in the Grand Canyon in the United States. And and elsewhere, Jackson Hole is a uh, Teton County Search and Rescue in Jackson, Wyoming has a great preventative search and rescue program. I think they call it Goal Zero. Their goal is to get zero uh, missions in a year. And so there's a lot of controversy about this. This is a topic for another uh, hour long talk, but um, we talk about trying to prevent problems in the wilderness, you know, limiting access uh, doesn't really work. We don't want access limited, right? We want to go outside and, and, uh, and, and explore the wilds. Uh, permit system works to some extent. Prepaint donation and the form of a SAR card helps. Uh, this was pioneered by Colorado and a lot of states have this. You buy a $30 search and rescue card and it doesn't get you anything other than shows people that you donated $30. So um, insurance, you know, is another way. This is the model they use in Europe. You know, um, I've been ski touring and climbing in Europe several times and you can buy um, 18 month 
search and rescue policy in Switzerland for $30 or 30 euros. You, if you uh, backcountry skiing in France and you using a chairlift, um, you can at some ski resorts, you can buy uh, pay three euros extra and get uh, three days of backcountry rescue insurance on your uh, lift ticket. And so that's an option. Charging for missions, which we generally don't do in the United States. There are some exceptions, some counties charge. Oregon is one of five states that does have a, a law that allows us to charge if we want to. Um, the search and rescue community in the United States is very against charging for missions. Uh, of course, fines, and that's this, uh, this was put up a few years ago at an area where we one year responded to probably six or eight rescues because the Hood River newspaper and the Portland Oregonian newspaper put out these stories about this fabulous new sport called uh, cliff jumping. And so um, we had so many people jumping off this cliff and uh, they passed a law to uh, fine people. And then finally, education. Education really works. It really, really works. And so educating people. This is a backcountry access gate uh, in Brighton. Well, it used to be called Brighton, Utah. Now it's called K the Canyons Ski Resort. It's part of the Park City Ski Resorts in Utah. And unfortunately, there was just an avalanche this year of somebody who went through this gate and uh, went out of bounds and um, died. Um, this is a sign I don't particularly like. This is an Alaska in Alaska, and I don't like this because the person who's likely to get injured is proportionally more likely male, uh, also demographically more likely to be in their 20s to 40s. And so if a 20-year-old male reads this open, that's me. Experts only, I'm an expert, they're gonna go. They're not gonna read all this mumbo jumbo. So I don't really like this sign. This is in Chile, Portillo, Chile in the Andes. Uh, this is a helmet campaign, a ski resort. This is in also, in, this is in Anchorage, also in Alaska. This is a, um, I like this, this is, I was cross country skiing on this uh, trail network, but it's also a bike network. But I like this because it has a little authority to it. Anchorage physicians endorse it. And this is a, sign in the canyon between Whistler Ski Resort and Blackcomb Ski Resort. It was a, I testified on a, a snow immersion, non-avalanche snow suffocation fatality. And this was, uh, they put up these signs after uh, the, that fatality and very simple, clear sign message. I really like this couple colors, little snowboarder upside down. And so um, I know that's really quick and I know that's a broad um, coverage of, of wilderness medicine, but I, I think what I hope you can take some of those lessons and find a way to incorporate them into your life and maybe it'll kind of guide your training if you, um, if you have um, uh, aspirations to do wilderness medicine as a career. Um, so we've got some time. I'm, I'm happy to take some questions. Dr. Van Tilburg, I just wanted to echo really quick. Thank you, thank you so much for giving us such an amazing talk. I don't wanna take up too much time because I'm sure, sure people have questions, but I really wanted to reiterate that we are all super thankful for your time. Um, so with that, Katrina and Alex will help run the Q&A. Everybody feel free to turn your videos on and throw your questions in the chat box and we'll take it away from there. Thank you. Thank you, Shelby and Dr. Talberg. Um, the first question that was submitted prior to the talk was, um, what kind of training or certification would we need to be effective medical directors for the search and rescue team we volunteer with? My recommendation is if you're interested in doing um, medical oversight as a career, find a way to do an EMS fellowship in the United States or Canada. I don't know about elsewhere in the world, but an EMS fellowship gives you those added credentials to um, supervise. You know, back when I trained, we, that wasn't a thing. And so the biggest value that I bring to the teams that I supervise is I'm an active rescuer. And some of the teams I took over, their previous medical director was not an active rescuer. And when they talk to me and I say, oh yeah, I've done that before. They're like, oh my gosh, we have a common language. So, so um, think about an EMS fellowship and, and get out there and, and um, put your hands on the litter and, and boots on the trail. Thank you. Um, the next question was, uh, you mentioned the formal debrief uh, has been shown not to be effective. What do you think would be or is more effective than the formal debrief post a stressful event with a team? Well, I should correct myself and say it's, it's not, it doesn't work really for our group because of our culture. 
Um, and so it may work for other groups really well. Um, but what we found is <clears throat> debriefing at the scene quickly, and then we have a longer debrief at our meeting, our business meeting that we have every month. And then what I do as a, a search and rescue a medical director, I make phone calls. I mean, I called uh, one of our team members today who got his second COVID vaccine and was um, in almost incapacitated. And so I, I make phone calls. I just call people and check in and say, how you doing? Do you need help? Um, if you a if you want to do a formal route, it might be better to do that individually through like an employee assistance program or uh, you know, a private therapist, because I think that might be more effective. People are, have trouble talking in front of other people and they hold their feelings in. And so, um, and so I, I think those would be some options. Yeah. Um, the next question is, can you talk a little about how you formed your diverse career? Yeah. So, I mean, I graduated from medical school in uh, 95. So back then we um, had like a travel medicine interest group and we had no um, formal wilderness medicine training. Um, and so um, I, I formed my career by, um, uh, I think, by um, seeking out experience and being persistent. Uh, I spent... Um, almost 12 years on the waiting list for one company to, to do um, expeditions abroad. And once I got in, I got two, one to two trips a year to Kilimanjaro and Everest Base Camp and all over. But it took me 12 years on the waiting list. So persistence, um, getting a broad experience, a lot of what I do with uh, expert witness consulting and as I mentioned with SAR teams, it's because I have patient care experience in the field. And that's so critical. I mean, if I testify in a case and the opposing counsel has an expert that can talk all day long about hypothermia, but, it's never, but is never taking care of a hypothermic patient in the field, there, it's just invaluable to have um, uh, field experience as uh, you know, in a career. Um, the next question, this individual, Ian, is a paramedic and would like to get into wilderness medicine. What certifications or trainings do you value most for your team members? We're a BLS team. Uh, so, um, you know, our team has to have, um, well, I should say one, one team I have is a BLS team. One team, uh, two teams I supervise are non-transport EMS teams. So I think um, if you're a paramedic, you can take uh, classes or, or, or go to conferences at the, from the Wilderness Medical Society or some other folks that do wilderness medicine training. I think there's still a national certification uh, addendum that's recognized by a lot of states for paramedics. That's a wilderness uh, EMT, which uh, might be um, beneficial. Um, I think, um, Far, as far as I think what I value most is probably, I mean, this is just from my team, is probably the paramedics and the EMTs who are firefighters because they are used to operating under a structure and evaluating patients and making plans ahead of time. Whereas my awesome colleagues who are rock climbers and they don't have a medical background, they're not arriving at a scene instantly thinking about extrication and evacuation like you know I am. So I don't know if that answers the question, but. Um, if the individual feels, if Ian feels like that question's not properly answered, you can follow up and I'll um, get that read out as well. Okay. Um, the next question is, do you have a strict training regimen you follow to keep your skills up to date as well as your physical cap capacities? What is the best way to incorporate this into a busy lifestyle as a working physician? That's a, that's a really great question. And um, I love that question. So, um, and I got into trouble uh, when I did my training because of that question. Um, so my train, you know, this is what separates um, a mountain rescue team. Uh, this is what sets a mountain rescue team apart is that we are living and breathing the skills of mountain rescue on our days off when we're not doing rescues. And so like tomorrow I'm going 
backcountry skiing tomorrow and Friday, I'm going backcountry skiing with four guys on my team and then a couple extra people, or maybe three guys on my team and an extra person. So we are, so uh, we keep the skills up because we're using them all the time. And if you're a swift water rescue person and, but you're also a boater and you kayak all the time, you're keeping those skills up all the time where we run into problems is like we have say a law enforcement officer or uh, who's attached to a search and rescue team that learned how to do search and rescue, but isn't a climber or a kayaker or a mountaineer. And so keeping up the skills, I mean, I use them uh, every day um, almost. Um, as far as incorporating, as far as incorporating staying fit and or uh, getting out and adventuring during a busy lifestyle, I think it's, it's, for me, it started at the very beginning of my career. And I somehow made a decision to put staying fit and staying in shape as a higher priority than getting good grades and getting honors and doing the extra work. And it hurt me sometimes in my career from an academic standpoint, but I, I never let go of staying fit. So I would, on my surgery rotation, I would, um, after rounds and when I got all my work done and before the after the noon lecture or whatever, I would go to the locker room, change into my running clothes and go run the ravines of Ravenna um, in Seattle. Um, I would bike commute uh, to and from the hospital, uh, basically almost my whole career of bike commuted. And, um, and when I have days off, I plan them to do something um, and stick to it. And so it's, it's really hard, but you have to, you have to prioritize it. And it's, it's hard. It's harder if you have a family and kids and, um, and, or spouse and, and, and all that makes it hard. But, um, you know, there's some 5 a.m. runs. There's a lot of dark runs. I mean, now with light technology and batteries, you can exercise all night if you want. So you for that, that was my question. And I am really appreciate because I feel like we're always doing so much in our lives and, I think it's important to keep your skills. I saw like team fitness was a big thing that you had on your like checklist. Mm -hmm. um, a quick follow-up, sorry to like hop in is, um, do you guys ever feel like when you do like the team fitness check that some people don't like hit the mark every time or your team as a whole is always basically incorporating a lifestyle that you just echoed right now? We have um, on both teams that I'm mainly active with, we have people that we are worried about when they go into the field. And it's a very difficult situation because we're volunteers. And these are people who were once fit and rock stars. And for whatever reason, they, um, you know, family issues or work issues. And, and it's a very difficult um, situation. If I'm the rescue leader, I'll sometimes give, try to give them a task that does that uh, is important that that doesn't involve um, that doesn't involve uh, you know extreme fitness, but it's it's a it's a tough situation. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, the next question was: Have you written? Do you, have you written in availability for SAR and do your contract at the hospital, or do you only do missions on your days off? Uh, it's not written in my contract, um, but I live in a small town. I mean, we have uh, 25,000 people in my county and 10,000 in my town. Our hospitals, you know, 30 bed hospital or less, I think. Uh, so it's not written in my contract. Um, I, uh, um, I have been known to leave work early to go on a mission. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, it just, it's a trade-off, right? It's uh, if, if I get a call and I'm at work and I got three patients left um, or actually the two years ago, we had a plane crash on Mount Hood and we needed some leadership, uh, not just me, but we needed three or four people who could be leaders and not just uh, ground pounders. And um, I canceled my day the following day and went up at um, 6 p.m. and spent the night in the mountain and brought down a body and uh, got home at, um, actually I got, I think I called my office from the mountain and got to work at one in the afternoon and did my afternoon. But um, that takes uh, a lot of, a lot of facilitating trust in my staff and taking care of my staff and recognizing them and um, letting them know that 
they are important and then letting them know that this is important and they're contributing to it. And so it it's not just canceling my day. It's, it's a lot of prep work and, um, and getting people to feel invested in this. So. Thank you. Yeah, that was my question. Um, I imagine that's kind of the toughest part of this is finding that, that balance between your day job and, and kind of the, the fun stuff on the side. Um, so thank you. I think we're, we're at the top of our hour. Um, so just being respectful of everyone's time, Dr. Ron Tilbury, do you have time for like one more question? Yeah, sure. I got, I got time. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, I think there's a couple interesting ones about um, managing scope of practice, about inclusion and diversity and legal risks. So any of those things you feel inclined to talk yeah, about? Yeah, I don't mind staying an extra 10 minutes if, if this is helpful to people or if people want to sign off and some people stay on. Um, so managing scope of practice and mitigating risk, I can um, address those in one piece. It depends on your jurisdiction. It's, it's just so dependent on your jurisdiction. So where, where I live in, in Oregon, in Hood River County, um, you know, we're allowed in Hood River to practice as a physician or a nurse or an EMT. Any licensed person can practice at their skill level as a good Samaritan and not be liable. So they can't practice out of scope of practice, but they can, uh, you know, and, and I'm, I'm board certified in family medicine and have, you know, uh, 20 years of emergency medicine experience. So my scope of practice is basically anything I feel comfortable with, but, um, but so um, I also have uh, liability insurance through our rescue teams. I have liability insurance through um, the uh, or state of Oregon for search and rescuers. I have a liability insurance through the Wilderness Medical Society. So, uh, and we also have more or less immunity as good Samaritans. So not totally, but we, we so, uh, you know, so the liability issue is covered. You do have to follow your scope of practice. If, if and this comes up with people who take wilderness first responder class and learn how to do a shoulder reduction, that class is not a licensed professional. So you're not allowed to do that as a, in any way because that's practicing medicine. So that's where it comes up. So you have to be a little careful, but for the most part, I think we're covered adequately. Awesome. And the other one was talking about how um, a local uh, SAR group has very few female members. Um, do you guys do any kind of recruitment or, uh, you know, diversity and inclusion kind of training or how do you um, get at that? Because it is in general, like a pretty white male field uh, up in the mountains. Yeah, um, I can tell you nationally, I'm the chair of the medical, uh, the MedCom medical committee for the Mountain Rescue Association and, and the MRA, the Mountain Rescue Association has a diversity committee and is actively addressing this. Um, and I think it's really important. Uh, we, our team, we don't actively recruit at all. We just, um, if people are interested, we, um, we kind of check them out first over the course of three, six, eight months. And if we like them, we um, bring them in. And I got to say, we have, uh, We've got um, quite a few women. We've got uh, one who's an awesome rescuer who's been on um, Mount Everest and has probably 40 or 50 Mount Rainier summits in her climbing resume. So um, really just, we have a lot of exceptional, uh, several exceptional women, but um, our team isn't diversing it, d addressing it, but nationally um, that's being addressed and recognized as an issue. Awesome, thank you. Um, and I think the last question that I see here and just reiterating that we will, um, you guys can send us your questions and we'll post them to the website later, um, is this uh, participant lives in South Florida. They don't have as many search and rescue teams there. Um, what do you suggest as a good means to practice or train uh, with limited opportunities in kind of regions like that? So I would recommend a uh, volunteer fire department if that's a possibility. I mean, you're gonna do patient packaging is gonna be very similar. Um, structure of patient assessment is being very similar. And you're still gonna see wilderness medicine issues. You're gonna see heat stroke and you're gonna see heat exhaustion and you're gonna see uh, open tib fib fractures, for example. So that would be a, a great way. I mean, really that would be a great option is um, 
EMS. Awesome. So I want to respect your time, Dr. Van Tilburg, and okay. everybody else's as well. Um, once again, thank you so much for giving such an amazing talk and um, staying around and answering some of these questions. To everybody that came today, thank you so, so much for coming. Next week, we have an awesome talk on aerospace medicine, so feel free to come by. Um, with my new board, we have a bunch of new wilderness programming coming, so stay tuned for that. Super excited, and I hope everybody has a wonderful evening and hope to see you guys super soon. And as always, feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Me and my board are here for you. So, yay, thank you so much. And once again, thank you, Dr. Van Tilburg. Please enjoy the rest of your evenings. Thanks. Thank Bye. you. Happy Valentine's Day, everyone. <laughs> Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Van Tilburg. Have a good night, everybody. Okay. Bye.